Okay, well, we're going to move on with our program and discuss securing the industrial control systems in the connected enterprise, and uh, we're going to talk quite extensively and technically now, uh, starting from a customer view in. First, I'd like to introduce our panel, uh, Jeff Jones from Microsoft, Maciek Kranz from Cisco, Shiraz Hassan from AT&T, Tyler Williams from Shell, and Frank Kulashevitz, who you've just heard speak. So with that, um, what I wanted to do today was uh, go through some of the concerns that we hear from customers and get Tyler's perspective in particular uh, as a customer on what are the key, what I'll call capabilities and or uh, sticking points to moving forward in a connected enterprise environment. So one of the things that you heard Keith talk about and you heard us talk about in the last panel a bit here was collaboration is really key to realizing a connected enterprise environment that involves merging IT and OT infrastructure together, but it requires a lot of complementary skills and technologies to do that. There isn't one vendor, including Rockwell, that can do everything to facilitate this. So we partner with people like AT&T, Microsoft, Cisco, and others uh, that you'll hear in the next panel as well uh, to facilitate the IT-OT integration and make sure the technology is future-proof and that you're guaranteed things like intellectual property protection, tamper resistance, and cybersecurity. So as we talk about security in general for industrial control systems, we recognize that this is a very hot topic at the moment. It's something that you all like to write about on a regular basis, so we thought it'd be appropriate uh, to have a couple of perspectives here from our partners as well as from a customer. And ultimately, if you're driving for a connected enterprise, you're looking for higher levels of visibility. We just talked about all of the data required to do that, the contextualization of all that in order to drive the efficiency that you're looking for and to get collaboration amongst your uh, various people and plants within your own organization. And that collaboration extends into partners as well. So we have our partners on stage to help kind of move that dialogue forward in the way that we kind of interact with each other in supporting customers to create a secure environment. So I guess the first stage of questions I'd like to kind of pose to the panel here is, uh, Tyler, you've been involved with a, a very highly uh, distributed organization in, in Shell. Um, you have a connected enterprise, uh, very dispersed, very, uh, uh, very spread out across the globe, and yet you have assets down below that may or may not be that terribly connected or that terribly analytic. But at the same time, you have the responsibility to make sure that that enterprise is secure. So from your perspective, how do you approach security uh, at a corporate level? And then what are the key aspects of implementation that you kind of worry about as, as you execute on a secure infrastructure for Shell? Where to begin? <laughs> um, I can unpack all that in how long? Five minutes? You've got 45 minutes. <laughs> all right. Well, take all the time you need. So uh, I think it was Jim in the previous panel mentioned that his journey started in 1993. And I feel equivalently under-equipped to synthesize the decade-long experiences we've had into intelligently articulated sound bites here. So I'm going to try my best. Um, but it's very difficult to do this uh, without trivializing some of the breadth and the scope and the scale, the challenges that we were, that we deal with. Um, and the truth is that the cybersecurity, even as a small company, is a extraordinarily non-trivial challenge. Um, I used to weigh about 100 pounds less than this, and I, I noticed one of the questions from the previous panel about a lot more uh-oh moments than aha. Uh -huh. I can resonate with that. A lot more uh-oh uh moments than aha. Uh um, but I wanted to tie, and I promise I'll get to your question, but I wanted to tie the, the um, story to what Keith had talked about earlier with a connected enterprise vision. Um, because we can all understand, at least at a high level today, the value proposition of connecting these systems, doing more with data and analytics, applying uh, new emerging technologies like the cloud, robotics, augmented reality. And most of us understand that that investment appetite will be based on business priorities today. And it'll be a change agenda that will be stabilized. It'll be a discussion amongst various partner community. And it'll be slow. Um, 
the challenge with security is unfortunately people want something done today. And they don't know really what they want, uh, but they want it now. And the risk is something we have to deal with today. So it's a bit different. I, I want to make sure people see the, the cybersecurity challenge, at least from a shell perspective, as a long-term journey. People say it's not a destination, it's a journey, and that's actually true. Um, but to get started, we had to, uh, in order to make some progress, we had to start with some philosophical statements. And um, the first, and I'm sure we'll get to this, is to tie cybersecurity to a business. Operate it like a business. Treat it like a business. It must have a business case. It has to resonate with your customers and or your business partners, your uh, technology providers, your suppliers. It has to be operated like a business. And there's a lot to unpack there. I'll leave that aside for now. The second fundamental principle is to unify the economy. Unify the cybersecurity economy deeply and, and from a wide perspective. And that's things like joint venture partnerships with Rockwell and working on competency models, on new technology developments, on security technologies, how to apply them, how to maintain them across the life cycle. But what it also means is unifying the language of risk across IT and OT. So having a common language framework. Um, and that's, again, that's a, a big topic I can go into uh, ad nauseum. But one of the major things that helped us drive security as an investment and as a strategy was aligning the concept of security and safety. Um, now, doing that is also non-trivial. Um, but as an organization, we are in the energy delivery business. And it's an exciting business to be in. The, the unfortunate part of our business is it's also a dangerous business. Um, and although our success in Shell is measured primarily in dollars and cents, in shareholder return and profitability, to be credible, to be affordable, and to be a leader in this space, we also have to make sure our people get home safe every day. So part of our initial success at moving security as an investment was to no longer delineate the concept of cyber and safety. Treat them as one and the same, and you'll get the hearts and minds of your communities, of your partners, and you'll be able to not only make a business case, because there is quite a bit of business case for safety in our business, but you'll also be able to drive investments in robustness and resilience at the system level, the network level, the organizational level. So I want to make sure that, that I touched on that because I hope we can drive into that a little bit because as a partner to us, we need you to use that same language and safety and security as an integrated concept. And as a side anecdote before I, I belabor the point, when we started that harmonization of that language, uh, we were trying to figure out the best way to apply that across, you know, 60 different countries and uh, various cultural imperatives that are, that are different across boundaries. And it turns out that when we Googled, I think it was, out of the eight most commonly used business languages in Shell, seven, English being the only one that's different, don't have a different word for safety and security. It's the same thing. So we've used that as to our advantage to say they, you know, linguistically it's not the same in your language, in your culture, in your operational in environments. We don't see them as different, so. So you have safety and you have risk, right? And risk presents an opportunity cost, right? right? So as, as you execute security within your system, do you, do you look at justifying it financially as purely a, a loss avoidance? Well, most of us probably are very familiar with the sales technique of security today, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and, and hackers are coming. And, and that's not necessarily untrue. It's just an ineffective way at moving people. Uh, it's not going to motivate behavioral change in an organization like ourselves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a common business model between supplier and end user. Um, so what we've done and we found to be very effective is, as, as you mentioned, we've kind of taken the approach of no longer talking about cyber attacks or, or cyber risk or hackers and connected it to the, the digital enterprise or our, what we call the digitalization journey as a business opportunity. So we see investment in cybersecurity as an opportunity cost to, or to uh, reduce the opportunity cost to uh, our future energy uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. So 
I guess I'd like to kind of shift gears slightly here and talk a little bit about the potential opportunity that stares at us. All of us are, are kind of looking right now at the opportunity in front of us with the industrial Internet of Things. And Internet of Things is a pretty broad spectrum view of what I would call smart transmitting devices at the end of the day. And there are, we advocate, of course, that within the industrial environment, they're all connected to a common Ethernet backbone, wired or wireless, doesn't much matter. But if you believe the numbers and you say, all right, if there's going to be 86 billion smart objects growing over the next 10 years or so, then we're going to have much smarter machines and smarter plants. And you look at all of that, part of that smart machine category would include OEMs that really want to be able to get a hold of information once their fleet is deployed so that they could do some form of analytic on it as well. So, when you look at that, are, are you seeing an interest in, in OEMs trying to kind of restructure service models, machine as a service, so to speak? Or uh, is there a user acceptance of OEMs even wanting to do that? You know, what, what are the security implications in that scenario? Me as well? Um, well, yeah, yes, we do see the business case for translating management of security into a business value from our supplier to us uh, as a service. So you know, translating a CapEx cost to an OpEx cost and not necessarily being the front end or early adopter of a bunch of new infrastructure. You know, how many firewalls is going to be enough with an you know, unidentified threat landscape. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about one of the values of having this unified ecosystem and having not only your ability to adjust your business models, which is traditionally not an as-a-service or engineering as-a-service model, with our own financial models. We see the, the P&L and the, and the balance sheet benefits, but we actually don't have those implemented into our businesses. So you can come out with as-a-service models, and on a PowerPoint slide, we can see the benefits, but we still need our transaction infrastructure to accommodate for that. And we need to work together to make that happen. Because if you invest ahead of us, we don't have the budget to help you justify that investment. Or if we do the same thing, it's going to be an unequal uh, distribution of resources. So I d even from a, like a conversational perspective around defining risk and what are we going to do to address the cyber threats, we need to find some way of doing this far more, co far, far more co cohesively. And we, Rockwell and Shell, have been doing that for, for quite some time. But you know, we have a 1,000 vendors in our environment. So it's not going to be solved by just having the four of us up here highly connected and, and unified. It needs to be a community effort. So, so John, maybe, <clears throat> maybe a general comment about the use case um, for the OEM. And then I'd like Masha maybe to talk about infrastructure. Sure. I'd like uh, Jeff to talk a little bit about the, the software and business system environment. And Shiraz, maybe the opportunity for high value assets um, you know, remotely. Um, the business case is clear. A number of our large OEM customers talk about digitization of their business. Um, they have fleets of equipment that are in the field today, and if, if many of those that are on more contemporary technologies, as Keith talked about earlier, that concept of future-proof, um, they're dynamiting those things today. Um, a lot of them have performance contracts. A lot of them um, uh, have responsibility for those systems, and so from a, a system uh, robustness, a, a throughput uh, for production, a line uh, operation, and and maybe eventually the improvement of their machines and, and different services they can offer. There's a number of customers who talk about that. So I think the business case is there. Um, the challenge is, is building that business environment so they can take advantage of that. So, so Masha, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I think that uh, uh, it's important to remember that security is not an add-on. Security is not a overlay. And I think, uh, Tyler, you, you touched on this earlier, which is, um, that security needs to be embedded in all of our systems, in all of our infrastructure, in all of our software at the architectural level. And um, I think all of us are, are firm believers in the architectural approach. Um, you know, if you, if you look at um, uh, sort of the, the challenge that uh, John, you mentioned, the billions of smart objects coming up, uh, the good news is that we actually are not starting from scratch. So um, if you look at uh, uh, the industries over the last 30 years, we've been actually working on solving some of these problems, uh, granted at a smaller scale, but some of these problems over the last uh, few decades. 
um, in terms of um, uh, how do we actually secure the infrastructure before the attacks, what happens during the attack, what, how do we minimize the impact of these attacks. So there are some, a lot of best practices. And, um, and the, the beauty of what we're doing now together is that um, we're creating these open architectures. Tyler, to your point, it's not about just a handful of vendors getting together. It's truly open architectures that um, can take the best of, um, uh, for example, from Cisco's perspective, what we've learned from the IT perspective, and combining it with um, Rockwell know-how from the automation world, right? So, for example, um, we've been working on um, joint efforts around um, architecture, but also firewalls, but also um, intrusion prevention, uh, but also around um, access control and so forth. So, so basically taking the best practices from both of our worlds and combine those into the uh, unified uh, approach. So we've worked with Cisco as Rockwell on reference architectures for some period mm -hmm. of time, right? And I think probably five, six years ago, we probably released the first one. How has is, how is that matured? Like, uh, can you point to differences now from, from then? Understanding the security is a journey, but how could you, you know, how would you illustrate the differences between now and then? Yep. I should remember when we launched uh, the first architecture, I think both of us were younger. And, um, um, <laughs> uh, but um, it was actually an interesting time because at that time, a couple of years ago, uh, we still were dealing with uh, a lot of um, mindset of sort of a security by physical separation. So my plan is not connected to the enterprise and to the cloud, thus we, it's secure. We were still uh, dealing with the uh, aftermath of Stuxnet, which basically debunked this whole model, um, and sort of the feeble attempts at solving the problem by, let's say, putting an industrial firewall in front of the, the PC on the manufacturing floor. And um, as we discussed earlier, at that time we, uh, we said, all right, we need to take an ar architectural approach and let's do it jointly. Um, so we embedded our security uh, capabilities into our, our infrastructure that we de developed together. But then we started do developing joint solutions around, um, um, again, firewall cap capabilities, intrusion protection, even um, intelligent uh, policy-based access control. Uh, so for example, uh, you could look at the policy that um, allows you to identify um, and specify specific actions that you take depending on what device you're actually using to access uh, the infrastructure, where you are, if you're on a plant floor or in Germany, um, what your role is. And um, so for example, if you are giving access to a contractor, um, let's say on the plant floor between nine to five, you have, you have certain set of rules. If this contractor is, let's say, outside of the plant, you can have a completely different rules. Um, but that's sort of a one set of activities which we used to um, build the um, foundation. But as I mentioned earlier, we also migrated our efforts into much more into uh, services, into um, um, en engaging with our customers, not with uh, sort of products and architecture, but also how do we help you make this migration and, and evolve your security systems. Because as Tyler said, it's a journey and it's, never, it's a never ending journey. There's always new threats that are coming up and we need to make sure that our capabilities are uh, fully up to speed. Uh, that's one of the reasons, for example, we bought a company called uh, Sourcefire two years ago and um, uh, we'll talk more about the cloud capability, but um, this is how you keep your security infrastructure um, and security policies up to date by basically centralizing the, the core capability in the cloud. And now I think if I look at the architecture, we're focusing much more on not only what happens before the attack, but what happens during the attack. How do you actually re uh, recognize, all right, there is this um, um, HVAC system talking to the um, to the cash register, that's strange. <laughs> or there is a, um, there is a, um, uh, a lot of uh, data that is being um, uploaded from the plant to your Dropbox. That's, that's unusual, <coughs> let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, the last piece I wanna highlight is um, we're putting a lot of emphasis also on how to minimize the damage. So assuming that the bad guys, whether they are inside or outside, get in, assuming they, they do some bad things, how quickly you can actually find out that there's a problem, but also how do you actually deal with it? And um, there are capabilities, like for example, um, uh, as part of the SourceFire acquisition, we, um, 
we uh, have this capability called an advanced malware protection. It gives you actually flexibility in how you can approach the problem um, because you can characterize, okay, I have a malware on my system. Let me figure out what this malware does. And in some cases, I may actually decide to, um, uh, to actually get rid of this malware. But in some cases, if it's benign enough, I can actually wait until my next window of um, my maintenance window so I don't disrupt my production facility to actually get rid of it. So, so it gives us, um, these capabilities give us much more sophistication and flexibility and, and comprehensive approach in dealing with security mm -hmm. issues. You know, when, when you look at the industrial environment, you're looking at what happens across the network and then Frank, we've got to also look at what happens inside the control system itself, right? And so a lot of what Machek talked about with access control, role-based access, anomalies and whatnot affect the control system directly as well. Do you want to go through what our tenants are around security and, and design for security philosophy? Sure. <clears throat> sure, John. You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, elements to security in the industrial space. Masha gave some great examples of secure network infrastructure and the advancements on, on what we have. Um, but only relying on the IT infrastructure to protect the OT area um, we found doesn't doesn't always work. Um, I don't know if everybody caught it, it was subtle, but Mashik talked about uh, threats from inside and out, mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's one of the subtle differences. Also, the type of infrastructure there uh, matters as well, <clears throat> and so we believe it's about um, uh, managing the threat both in the network and software environment, but also within the the physical hardware itself. And so when we talk about things that are important to us, we talk about a secure network infrastructure. We talk about uh, authentication and policy, policy management, and Mashek has talked about that already. Uh, we talk about uh, tamper detection. Um, that's very important, what, what was touched and what, why was it touched and what happened. Um, we talk about intellectual property protection. Um, that really goes to both our users and OEM, uh, protecting the recipe for their products, protecting the capabilities of their machine. And finally, it's about um, resiliency and robustness. Um, and so. So when we think about those in the industrial space, we think about those in a kind of a layered security model. Um, and you can think about that from the enterprise down or from the control and automation system out. And so protecting the controller, protecting the connections, um, uh, secure connections, safe connections, uh, protect the network, protect the software, um, uh, work our way up to the, to the DMZ and into the enterprise. And so this, this idea of, of partners um, uh, is really important for that end-to-end -end security approach. And so we know our role as the automation supplier and, and what we need to do within our architecture and systems, and, and frankly, as well as within our partner products um, that participate in that, that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also important we recognize that there's more in the plant um, than just our solutions and how we protect and secure those as well as they interoperate together. Yeah, so to Tyler's point earlier, I mean, when, when when Shell looks at security, they correlate it almost directly to safety. And, and Rockwell's got a pretty strong reputation as a machine safety leader, if not the leader in machine safety. So as we look at design for security, we're also talking about creating a safer uh, control system at the same time and, and linking that. But, but along with that comes things like standards bodies in, in organizations that tend to write different standards around safety and security. Are we seeing any kind of unification of sorts between security and safety standards bodies? Sure, uh, maybe a, a couple general comments. First, I, I like how Tyler characterized the use case for security in industry and relating that to safety, and that's, that's a little bit of what you talked about. Um, we see similarities <laughs> um, between security and safety in, in the form of things like policy management, uh, resiliency, and robustness. Um, uh, Customers went from expecting automation systems to be uh, reliable, run 24-7, to being safe, um, protecting personnel, keeping machines running and production running, um, to being secure. And so there's been a walk over time of that progression. I think Keith mentioned that um, during his talk. Um, and so um, as that has occurred, uh, a couple things have changed. Um, as a, a technology provider in the automation space, we've changed how we develop products not just security products, but all our products. And so we have a very robust design for security system. Um, we self-audit, um, we self-test, we certify tests uh, to make sure those systems are uh, robust and resilient. Um, there is a, 
has been a change ongoing in industry. Um, we've been working with a number of providers of, of safety solutions for years, getting certifications. Uh, many of those safety companies and others are starting to look at security certifications and, and um, you know, uh, policy and practice against those. And so we're engaged with them already uh, in that space, as well as uh, certification bodies in, in design for security. So, so there's a lot of things that have changed over the last several years around security. Uh, one last point. Um, we also think there's a connection between network security, um, physical security, safety, and security in, in industrial um, uh, uh, areas. And so nobody's quite made that connection yet, but I think we're hopeful with this team of partners that we might be the first to do that. Yeah, sounds good. So let's That'd be nice. take a little bit of a <laughs> good, good luck. You a project yeah. for us then? That's a use case. I'm, right? I'm willing to celebrate the win that we're talking yeah. with an uh, automation supplier and an IT company on the same yeah. stage for the first time in, in my uh, decade of working here. So je that's a win in and of itself to get these two worlds speaking the same language, talking about aligning business models. It's, it's not going to help us manage our risk today, but it will in five well, I, years from now. I think you'll see it more. I mean, because even separate from OT, w even with IT and cloud computing, there's a convergence going on there. I mean, if you look at when we started, when I started the company like almost 15 years ago, it, it, some of the things we've talked about here about how you build products, right? So it's a recognition we need to build security in, secure <laughs> development life cycle, how you do that. But the implicit assumption at that time was we build them, we hand them over to you, you figure out the solution, how you're going to manage it, that sort of thing. And over time, there was needed, That's expensive. There was needed customer management capabilities, so those those got built. But with with co cloud computing, one, um, it it has allowed us to grow it out in a way that we could design security in from from the start, uh, which is good. Uh, but it is a very different perspective when. Uh, you know, the cloud is essentially us running your network, right? Sure. And the trust requirements there, uh, security, security, you know, security, privacy, reliability, uh, uh, resiliency, it's table stakes, right? Because if you look at whether you've been doing it uh, in, in a good manner or a poor manner, <laughs> and when you manage your own data center, there, you know, there's a, uh, uh, a way you think about it. The fact that you have control, even if your security controls are immature halfway across the board, when you think, when, when a customer thinks about uh, making someone else the trusted steward uh, of their data, uh, of the things they make decision on, on the business, uh, then, then it's, a, it's a very different model. So uh, in some ways, I feel like our, our requirements for, you know, for that, yeah. the back end, the computing in the cloud, it is higher across the board because every customer has those higher higher requirements. I th but I think it's worth noting here, at least from a customer perspective, that the, the last three kind of uh, directions of the conversation have been around the cloud and new advanced detection capabilities, and that all is wonderful. I still have a difficult time patching Windows 3.1 in some of our facilities. So the control is not patching. <laughs> Gotta so, screw that down. I mean, I, I, I say that only to, to get a, a level set in the discussion. That although as in we want we have the appetite to invest in new technologies to embrace the cloud and virtualization, robotics, and we understand that by doing that, our traditional approach to managing risk in this environment does not work. One of the things we've tried to do to bridge those two worlds so that we can be one of the first companies to, to adapt to these new environments and new technologies is to basically do the basics today, even though they may not be as sexy and attractive. So patching a Windows operating system is labor intensive. We have to do it across 30 suppliers. It requires physically attending a location. And it was fascinating that, that we couldn't get Rockwell and, and uh, uh, Microsoft together and figure out a way to just deploy those patches to show one place every seven days. Why do you send 47 CDs around the world that I have to then put, build a staff up to do that? 
So we had a conversation internally to say, well, let's, let's just do work together on that. Let's automate the basic blacklisting security, te the security techniques. And most of us who are technologists think, oh, that's, that's not going to protect you against the emerging advanced persistent threat. And you're right, it's not. But what it is going to do for us is going to get a, get a system working in our 137 plants around the world to just operate security as a part of their business. And then it becomes more easy and, quite frankly, more cost effective to add the cool new technology once those processes have changed. So people look at Shell and go, well, you're not doing these latest and greatest technologies. You're right. Purposely, we are, we are addressing risk over the long term by simplifying today because we know we're going to capture a heck of a lot more value than our competitors by going after the cloud and using unmanned operations and taking advantage of all these opportunities in a dynamic energy market. But we can't do that if you just want to throw something on top of a 55-year-old engineer who is in fixed in the ways of working and, and is not interested in adapting to uh, the environment. We have to deal with both realities. But actually, it's a, it's a very valid point, which is, um, when you look at the, um, the security um, attacks and the cyber attacks, the vast majority of them are exploiting known vu vulnerabilities, right? So it's sort of like, as you said, going back to basics, but it's very much um, us as an industry adopting and implementing the well-known solutions to well-known problems that will deal with the majority of the issues. And then we can start dealing with the advanced new threats and so forth. So, um, so I think it's a very good um, reminder, a good, good mindset, which is um, let's start with the basics, let's deal with, uh, with the known problems, let's learn from each other before we start focusing on a new, a new sophisticated threat. I also think what, what Frank was saying earlier, though, sorry to, to keep hogging the mic time up here, but it's interesting if you allow us as an end user to do the basics, and you stop bombarding me with sales calls for your next generation solution, and you focus on that, we do that together. I don't mean to disrupt the evolution that I'm seeing companies like Rockwell take, because in five years, you're gonna add a solution that's gonna help me run a process, and by definition, it's gonna be an order of magnitude more robust than it is today. So it's kind of, we kind of are in this chasm where we need to, you need to advance your security technologies, and we need to evolve our business models, but we have to be a bit left alone today to deal with the shiny objects. We're, we're bombarded with the Stuxnet in the newspaper that goes across every VP in Shell, and what are we doing about this? We have to get people to operationalize the basics, but we can't go to you guys and say, we're not willing to pay for the new stuff we expect in a few years. We have to find some way to, I yeah. guess, jointly invest. You know, there's, there's something we're talking about under the hood here. Um, we earlier talked about ITOT conversions. And so what we're talking about is how IT works um, in this more structured security environment that's persisted for a longer period of time and how OT is starting to figure out how to work in that same environment. And much of what Tyler is saying is about uh, getting on a normal business process cadence of addressing security, starting maybe with a baseline fundamental set of, of things and then progressing that and maybe being cognizant as you make changes in your plants on, on you know, trying to evolve that at a faster rate as change occurs for business investment reasons. And so that, that, that fundamental issue of acknowledging the fact that you can't put the stuff in the industrial environment, let it sit for two decades and, and run your machine without having some way to address security over a normal cadence of business is something that has to change. Um, and, uh, you know, the security risk will drive the change. Well, I think there's, I mean, the migration path and looking at the longer term, the last panel talked a lot about future proofing, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk about Windows 3.1, there wasn't much future proofing at that point. Uh, at the same time, it, we had a conversation before we came up about newer platforms that are more secure, more resilient, and serviceable, right? Securely serviceable from a remote manner. But at the same time, that's not going to be deployed immediately in the next three months. Oh, and it can't so, so I think there's that balance. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, and circling back though, but there, there are new, I think there are new things going on, right, in terms of analytics and decision making that can connect to manage the existing things. You know, we have secure, you know, you've got your endpoints, you can have secure communications back to collect the massive amounts of data I've heard about today. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, but then there's some of these newer advances that I think can be leveraged then 
Uh, and then on the security side, that's happening too. If you look at us, we've got telemetry from consumer, from other services, from all around the industry that end up feeding in to identify potentially uh, IP addresses associated with malware in the last 30 days or whatever, which can then benefit a solution to say, you know, it's not just, oh, this weird connectivity in two places at once or whatever, but this is actually connectivity attempted from some place where, uh, you know, where there's malware been associated or whatever. So I, I think there is a combination of recognizing you have to use a more holistic risk management model that might involve physical security and not allowing any certain types of connectivity for yep. something you can't service uh, and leveraging newer capabilities yeah. uh, coming in as well. You, you know, it's interesting to listen to the discussion of customers. Tyler is, I would say, on the more mature side of industrial security. Um, I've been called worse. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and many customers aren't. Um, and so the solution that, that Jeff was talking about uh, and how you might uh, advance your security capability or, or some of the comments Mashu makes are important. Um, I think in the next panel, they're going to talk a little bit about data-driven services and um, security network services, is, I think, is one of the ones they'll touch base on. But um, those types of aids to customers can help work through this very complex weave of installed base and life cycle over a long period of time over many plants. Um, and find some of the baselines as well as maybe some of the opportunities in specific areas to be more robust where we need to be. Because there's applications in your business that are of, of greater risk perhaps than, sure. than others. Yeah. And if I think back to the last panel, you know, we talked a lot about people, process, and technologies. All right, well, that applies to operations in general and running your ops, uh, but it also applies to the life cycle of your security maturity. Too. So as you mature in, in security, there is a people, process, and technology roadmap and policies that have to be developed over time, and they're going to mature at a certain rate, and your organization may or may not be ready for some of that, which is what I think you were saying. But in my perception is there's a lot of sea change technology that, that kind of encroaches on your timeline, and mobile, cloud, and cellular type technology. I mean, we're all running around with cell phones and we're swapping between Wi-Fi and cellular access to your, your dashboards and probably even your equipment. And OEMs have that same capability. So I wanted to explore that, that kind of netherworld of, of here's the cloud, here's cellular, here's mobile, all of this infringing technology is rushing at you and you're adopting it rather quickly. And so, how do you deal? Another world, I like yeah. that. How do you, you know, so how do you deal with that? And I guess I want to throw it to Shiraz briefly, just to get a perspective on how a cellular different than any of the other security aspects that we're talking about here. So, so you know, we've been in this journey of Internet of Things, or now it's called the Industrial Internet of Things, for a long time now as well. And we, security is one of the very first conversations that always comes up, and. From a cellular network perspective, we have created a very secure technology working with Rockwell and Cisco in the past, and it takes an ecosystem to get there, for sure. We're not trying to do everything ourselves. But what we figured out in very early for enterprise customers like Shell to trust us and trust cellular technology, we had to start by proving the security of the cellular network, and we did that very early in the process. We today have the ability on our cellular networks to provide private IP addresses to the endpoint devices. We can route the traffic that comes from an endpoint back into a customer's enterprise MPLS or their ATM frame relay network, if you guys are still using those as well, without it being ever vi being visible to the internet or touching the internet. And we take a multi-layered approach, so that's just at the network layers, right? Then we also work with software partners like Microsoft and hardware partners like Cisco to make sure that we can deploy at the OS level at the device um, some VPN technology so it can help with the secure communication. And also, once it hits a customer's uh, firewall, there are protocols you can build in to allow and see what kind of information should be coming from that particular endpoint and where is it allowed to go once it hits the enterprise firewall. And if there's any delineation in either one of those two aspects, it can drop that communication. 
We've taken it a step further in the last few years with the evolution of the amount of devices that are being connected now is to actually only take the relevant information and transmit it over the cellular network to begin with, right? So it can be an event-based trigger, an event that triggers um, an action from the devices and the information. The other information can be collected and in most cases just dispersed at the endpoint itself. Mm -hmm. Great. And I guess one last thing, I guess, Jeff, you know, for your benefit, you know, cloud seems to be this, uh, on one hand, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse to a lot of end users I talk to. You know, they, they, some of them will tell me, you know, there's no way we'll ever put anything up on a public cloud, except for all of their HR and <laughs> yeah, so things like that, but but they won't run their fa they won't take any of their factory information and move that uh, out of their four wall environment. So so how does Microsoft reinsure uh, you know with your cloud strategy and you know the the secure nature of public versus hybrid versus private cloud activity because it seems to be kind of a hot button at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so a couple things. I mean, uh, I do believe. Every customer we deal with, I think of as is hybrid in some sense nowadays. Uh, and whatever um, industry you go into, there's always some things they're going to keep, uh, you know, in their own their own data center. Uh, as I said, we've been for 15 years working on on building security, security, privacy, reliability in, and and so the, our cloud has benefited from from that. And as as was mentioned, having principles, uh, so. Cloud trust being such a thing, it's security, privacy, transparency, and control, uh, and compliance. So, uh, I mean, you, you have big customers who can have big security operations, big IT departments. They've got a global presence. They manage it, uh, it all themselves, and, you know, like we are a global company. But So where I think some of the benefit comes in is when you have... Uh, smaller, medium companies who can't get those resources, they can't get those experts, whereas we have this cumulative and aggregate effect of we can keep our systems up to date, that's just, that's an, that's an easy one for us, but we can also get the best practices and the resources uh, and then provide that service wherever it's needed. So we are on the ground dealing with whatever it takes in China to get a data center that operates there that, that deals with the local regulatory issues, that can work with you know, a local company there to make sure they have what they need to get compliance, right? But at the same time, it's the same service, the same capabilities, the same management that they, they would have if they were in Germany, or if they were in the UK, if they were in, in the US. So if they look at doing a small prototype somewhere, wherever it happens to be convenient for them and proving it out, then they can uh, potentially scale it up as needed, deploy it in other geographies where we're uh, carrying the bulk of the you know, specialized hard work around mm -hmm. security as it relates to compliance and, and some of the things that, mm -hmm. that uh, people have to deal with. Yeah, I think there are a lot of interesting points here, right? One, one is that, um, um, as uh, Jeff, you mentioned this, um, uh, that uh, hope is not a strategy. And um, uh, we actually have been de developing tools that uh, would allow uh, customers, whether they are large or small, to actually identify um, which are cloud services, whether they're public or, or not, are being used. And I think um, uh, every time we actually run through this uh, process, we find that people are surprised because, um, because um, you have a policy and compliance and you have a reality. So being able to actually look at uh, what the actual practice is, what, what of these, uh, which of these uh, services are being used, and then controlling and managing access to these uh, services is sort of a job one, right? Mm -hmm. The second one is, an, I, and I sound like a broken record, but it's an architectural approach and consistent approach. <laughs> and um, and um, I know that um, the Microsoft has exactly the same approach, which is you need to be able to have a consistent architecture and give customers ability to use either public or, or uh, private or hybrid capabilities with different consequences in terms of access, in terms of um, SLAs, in terms of security and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, the, uh, I think we would all agree, and I think this is more of a question for you, Tyler. I, 
I think security is no longer an excuse for not taking action. I think the technology has evolved enough where you can provide a secure, connected enterprise. I, I think what's left to be done is a collaboration between the ecosystem partners to make sure that the solutions and technologies we put up to your points are backwards compatible, and they're economically feasible for a shell to be able to adapt. I think if we can get to that second point, I think we will see a much bigger adoption, not just in the oil and gas services industry, but I think overall in general a as well. Perfect point. The unfortunate part about that is it requires stasis. Like we have an implementation challenge. You, right. you have technology solutions today, it's gonna to take me five years to roll that out in probably one of my business segments. And by that time, you've evolved. The threat landscape has evolved. So I, I, there needs to be some appreciation for the time it takes to operationalize security, embedded into your processes before you add another bolted on um, uh, cool technology. And I, I mean, I, I keep hearing, and I like, I like the message of having a, we have what we need today to be effective at the risk landscape today, to protect ourselves against the risk landscape but we still aren't translating that to business value. So an integrated architecture which embeds security like a segmentation suite, what value is that giving me? How is it going to help me do more with analytics? Because the architecture isn't gonna solve my physics problem of moving a packet from one side of the world to another. That's your, you have a challenge that you have to help with there. You guys have to standardize the data acquisition and distribution and storage problems, and you guys have to help us compute, and you guys have to route all that wonderful stuff. If you tell us security is built into this new business opportunity, then we say, fantastic. Let's install that business opportunity and allow you to manage security on our behalf, and let us get back to making oil. Yeah, I would say that, you know, Security is not the, the security is not the business value proposition to begin with. Right? If the conversations around business proposition starts with security, I think you're having the wrong conversation. But I think that's where most with, of right? us are. are I, I think starting, the right? conversation first has to where are the efficiencies needed, right? Are there process improvements that can be implemented that can produce efficiencies and hence cost savings to an enterprise? And to employ that solution, what are the security risks that we have to adhere to? I think that's the process you have to go down. And if you look at it from that, I think I would say in most cases, you can find a business case to do something. I yeah. mean, we can tell you those yeah. business cases. We, I think, we, I mean, I think we that's need you to. Part, part, like, too. I mean, we, we're shaded towards security because that's what this <laughs> panel is, right? But some of the benefits to cloud are, you know, to establish the business case exactly. or those traditional ones that everyone understands. Uh, and I, I say that in quotes, but you know, it's it's yeah. that server model, you know. So us being able to have, say, you don't worry about keeping the platform up to date or the level of hardware. Tell us, tell us what capability you need. Right. And if once a quarter you need a lot more computing power because you're going to do uh, this really big analysis, you only do periodically to make to inform your decisions. You can scale it up and scale it back down. So a lot of the savings and the justification in the business model aren't particularly or uniquely security related, the, you know, they're, they're the cloud, cloud computing benefits. But the, but the difference from the old model of where I give you the products and let you manage the risk is yeah. security, privacy, transparency is a baseline requirement for you to buy into, you know, into the cloud model itself. So I, I think that's just, it's a little bit of a nuance, but I, I actually think both of you are right. Because yeah. um, I think there are actually <laughs> business cases. She's trying to sell me something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why I see the middle here. Um, but I mean, if you look at the security specific business uh, justification, what are the, some of the major challenges? And Teller, you mentioned some of them, but uh, in terms of scale, in terms of dealing with legacy, but it's also a question of scarce resources. We don't have enough security experts in any of our companies, right? Um, uh, you don't want to get more log entries. You, um, you don't want to have more false positives. How do we help you automate some of these processes, right? So I think there, is a, there, there are very compelling um, uh, business cases for security operations themselves, as well as for the broader business operations. What if we address the people problem, though, instead of creating a discipline around industrial cybersecurity, which is traditionally consulting-oriented, and build that capability into our engineers? So 
I, I would be out of a job because I'm don't, a don't you think that's going to happen over time? Well, we've worked okay. with you guys on that. I mean, we yeah. launched the industry's first hybrid industrial cybersecurity certification for yep. people with o almost a thousand people certified now. But that's it's you know, very similar to how we to do it, no. for in engineering software in general now, right? Uh, engineering comes in with training. We require they learn our secure development process. It is, you know, Cisco Cisco has has a similar thing now. I mean, it's yeah. not exactly apples to apples, but I think it's a similar convergence. I mean, if if we were to hire someone and they refuse to learn those principles, that they, they won't last long. It's it, it is a requirement. So I so it, it, my but. To close up the point is, I, I actually think it's a fruitful path, and uh, and I don't think having the separate discipline. In my sense of my sense of security here is that <clears throat> right now you might be paying a premium for it to move with it as it evolves, but over time it'll assimilate itself into everything and, and be fairly innocuous. Not that it doesn't ever change, but it's going to become less of a stand out, stand alone consulting issue in and of itself and become Aspects of much it. more adoptive, you know, broadly. So with that, I have to cap this off and ask for questions from the audience, because I know you'll keep going. So <laughs> <laughs> any Pointing. questions from the audience? We've got the mic up front and raise your hands and we've got some roaming mics out there. <laughs> One in the back center. Leo Plona, Industrial Ethernet Book Magazine. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about the human aspect of, of cybersecurity. I think we were talking a lot about technologies and business cases and only briefly mentioned what's the problem with the engineers down in the field who actually have to implement it. Well, I mean, I, I can start with what we've done as a community to address that problem. Um, so one of the things I talked about earlier was a challenge around unifying the, the technology economy. And one of that aspects is governance. So who owns risk versus who owns the infrastructure deployed to manage that risk? Who owns the service contracts? Is it the facilities? Is it global? It's an it's a unbelievably complex uh, governance structure. Instead of trying to dictate requirements across, again, m many countries, multiple languages, uh, varying different business models, we decided to embed that skill set into a currently operating model. So having system engineers, maintenance personnel, software developers, all required to have the same benchmark levels of skill. So for example, Rockwell would, had hel helped us create this global certification called the GICSP, Global Industrial Cybersecurity Certification Program. And it started with our organization and four other oil and gas companies. And we don't generally work together uh, in a hyper-competitive market like ours. But we realized that we were all investing internally in these, in these open university systems, which is expensive internally, and they're all saying different things. And then we were going to Rockwell and saying, we want you to supply us with systems that are, that are installed by this level of competency. And you had a different request from other people. So you can't harmonize your business model around training. So we got together and created a simple benchmark that we, we stole from the IT competency framework, from our engineering competency framework, safety and cybersecurity, put it all together, and built a certification on that. And I think I mentioned earlier to celebrate these small little victories of having IT and OT companies together and hashing out where the profit will be to sell us cool new solutions. Same sort of thing happens in the industry around these people. They, all of us got together and we decided this is a problem, we have to solve it. We created the first step and it, it, by no means is it a panacea. It's not gonna have the next generation of intrusion detection experts, but the guy who's sitting there or the girl on the operating station is now gonna be able to understand what this latency on the HMI, that, that might be something I need to alarm now because the application is not going to do that for, yourself, for itself today. But they may be a part of that solution. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but a centralized, community-oriented competency model embedded into our suppliers, into our inst installation got, or implementation teams, our capital projects, our operating and maintenance folks. Maybe I can add to it. From the vendor, vendor community perspective, um, in addition to what Tyler mentioned, uh, I think we have two responsibilities. One is to help um, educate uh, the, 
um, various levels of, um, of a workforce on uh, specifics of security, and uh, we've actually rolled out some, uh, some training and some certifications. But from the product perspective, uh, a lot of this, again, going back to your point uh, around shiny objects, for us, it is about simplification and automation, right? Um, so that, um, because you will never get enough security experts to do everything. So, so in some way, from our perspective, um, the job one is how, how can we help you automate these processes so that um, you actually don't have to hire this one more security person that you don't have, that, we, that you can simplify the process. And that's sort of the foundation, right? And uh, then we can go into um, more sophisticated tasks after that. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with that too. And I, I would take it one step further that your security rests also on people who are non, uh, all the people who are non-security people. That's a good so point. if you look at in our data centers, we migrated to a model where no administrator has persistent administrator access and uh, they get only just-in-time access and it's audited. So then uh, there's not a matter of, that's a very narrow example, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, but it's, uh, there's not a need to trust that person uh, with, with, the, with the level of power, right? You automate the process, you simplify it, you have the ability to audit it, uh, and it, frankly, it, you know, it came from a threat model where you have a specific risk, you know, the, the best practices put in place to mitigate that risk. And so I think there's a lot of things you can do to, to, to do that assessment and then, and then use automation and, and process, combined with process, to, to help mitigate those things. And you can go back and support XP, please. <laughs> <laughs> That was your agenda would, for the whole I would, love to, <laughs> I hope I would love to see your okay. risk assessment on running, running products that are unsupported, yes. Uh. <laughs> okay, so, unfortunately, we're out of time. That went quick. It did go quick. Uh, They're all asleep, and I can't. Yeah. We're just uh, getting into the conversation. I know, you're just getting to the good stuff. So, uh, these gentlemen will be around through lunch. If you want to seek them out uh, after the panel, feel free to do so. Uh, with that, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for a vigorous discussion. Right. Appreciate it. And um, as soon as we clear off, I'm going to introduce uh, Sajit Chan, our chief technical officer, as our next moderator for the for the next panel. So, gentlemen, thanks again.